Welcome to Westminster. We're so excited that you're worshiping with us this morning. Um, it's a happy 4th of July. Uh, it's always fun when holidays fall on Sundays. I hope you've had a great 4th of July weekend so far. I uh, just want to draw your attention to if you have not signed up yet for our ladies night out. Ladies, you want to sign up. It's this Thursday night at six o'clock. You can register on our website. That just helps us know how many people are coming, but it's going to be a great night. I hope you will come. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email or call me. Um, other than that, uh, we do have a swim party for children on July 7th. So that's that Wednesday before our women's event. If you want to come to that, you can see um, more about the event in our weekly email. And then feel free to contact me and let me know if you're going to come or ask any questions. Well, let's pray together so we can get started with worship. God, you are good and you are faithful and we are blessed to just be in your presence this morning. Lord, I pray as you um, bring us into worship, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will prepare our hearts and our minds to receive whatever it is you want us to receive today. God, we thank you that even in the midst of wherever everyone is at today, we can be in your presence and we can stop and we can focus and we can listen to you, Lord. I pray that you give Meredith the, right, the words that you want her to speak and that we can hear your spirit speaking through those words. In Jesus' name, amen. Quiet, we 
shine out in your parade. Oh, oh, we shine out in your parade. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Let us all enjoy worship together this morning. Hello, everybody. Hello, boys and girls. I am Sherry Vaughn, and I'm filling in for Miss Millie today, who couldn't be here. And instead, I'm going to deliver the children's message to you. So I'm so excited I get to do that. Um, I wanted to share something that I have, and many of you may not know what this is. Have you seen this before? This is a road map. It's a map that tells us where we are and where we might want to go. I was traveling several years ago with my family in a place called Sydney, Australia, and the people at the hotel gave me this map. And I was staying somewhere down here, and I wanted to get to the very tip of where the water was so I could see some special sites that were there. And so they gave me this road map, and it told me if I walk down here, and I turn left here, and then turn right, eventually I would get to that area. So this is a road map, and it helps us know where we are and where we're going. Well, today the sermon is entitled, How Do I Get to Heaven? And God gave us a road map on how to get to heaven. He gave us the Bible, and the Bible tells us how we can get to heaven one day. In the Old Testament, King David and many of the prophets refer to God as God in heaven. So we know that God lives in heaven and we have to figure out how we can get there. So the Bible tells us how to do that. And Jesus in John 14 verse six, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So through Jesus, we are able to get to God the Father who is in heaven. So how do we do that? Well, in Romans, it tells us exactly what we have to do to get to heaven. It says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you're saved and you believe in Jesus and you declare and you tell people that you believe in Jesus and that he rose from the dead, then you will be saved and one day you will get to go to heaven. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? That we one day will get to live for all eternity with God and Jesus and those that have believed and have come before us. So I'm pretty excited about that. I love the earth that we live in now, but I hope one day to be able to spend eternity in heaven with God. And I can know how to get there through the Bible, through reading my Bible and studying it and finding out what the prophets and Jesus and the disciples told us about living for Jesus. So let's pray and let's remember that God gives us our roadmap through the Bible with how to get to heaven. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for our church. Thank you for our special children who go to our church. And thank you, God, that you give us a roadmap that will help us one day get to heaven through the Bible. Help us to read it and study it 
and to know more about you and to learn to love you more each day. Help us, Lord, in this coming week to honor you. In your most holy name I pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. We'll be reading 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Westminster. Welcome back to another Sunday morning. It's wonderful to see everyone this morning here on the internet. If you've not met me before, I'm Pastor Meredith Mills. I'm privileged to pastor uh, Westminster, which is a community of faith at the corner of Baring and San Felipe in the Galleria area in Houston. And in the age of post-2020, we're everywhere. And so wherever you're joining us from, some of you are joining us from here in Texas, and some of you are a very long way away. Wherever you're joining us from, welcome. Uh, we're glad you're in worship with us. We are currently in a sermon series called Stuff Kids Ask. And so we're, we're, what we're going through is, is questions people have about the faith. You know, these were questions that were asked by children, young people in our, in our faith community. Um, but the feedback that we've gotten as we've gone along the series is that these aren't just questions kids have. These are some of the basic questions about the Christian faith um, that sometimes you get from your coworker or sometimes you get from your brother-in-law, or sometimes you never had answered as a kid yourself. And so as, we, as we've been going along this series, turns out most of us really didn't understand this stuff to begin with. And so um, this is stuff kids ask, but also just stuff everyone asks. If you want to find any of the previous sermons, they're all on our YouTube channel. Uh, and I will note for those of you who worship with us regularly online on Sunday morning, um, we have been posting the live version of the sermon as well, which is always slightly different from the pre-recording. And so if you want to go back and check out the sermon-only clips, you can see that live recording on our YouTube channel. This morning is one of the most common questions we get. Um, and it's one of the most common questions I get as a pastor and probably that I asked as a young person, and it's this, how do I get into heaven? How do I get into heaven? And it's usually phrased exactly like that. Now, when I was a young person, I remember asking my mother, as soon as I started to kind of figure this thing called Christianity out, I asked my mother one night, no, I told her, that's right. She asked, you know, we'd studied goal setting in school and I told her, my goal is to get into heaven. And so I'd outlined what I was going to do to get into heaven. And it had, you know, Bible study and prayer and giving and things like that. And she looks at me and she goes, sweetheart, there's nothing you do to get into heaven. It's free. Jesus already did it for you. And I was like, yeah, that doesn't sound right to me. Um, and the truth is, it didn't sound right to me uh, because that did, it's free. Like, what, what does that even mean? Um, it so didn't sound right to me that for the rest of my childhood, I was compulsively asking Jesus into my heart um, because I was, I was convinced that I hadn't done it right. Uh, I didn't have some sort of wild mystical experience. And so then I thought it must not have worked and therefore I must not be saved and therefore I must be going to hell and therefore, oh my goodness, I've got to get into heaven again. So if that loop sounds at all familiar to you, the sermon is for you. If that loop does not sound familiar to you, then there's, there's less uh, unlearning to do because the truth is, the truth is it's the wrong question. It's the wrong question. Now, I am going to answer the question because your kids are going to ask it and uh, people in your life are going to ask it. <sighs> but it's the wrong question. It's the product of a version of Christianity that saw Christianity as escapism, that saw Christianity as primarily souls escaping a fallen earth instead of God redeeming a broken earth. You hear the difference between that? So this version of Christianity 
uh, has become more or less popular at various points in history, but is marked by um, an emphasis on leaving our bodies and this, this fallen creation behind and escaping to a perfect world called heaven, which happens after this lifetime. Now, the difficulties with that is that's not actually what the New Testament teaches at all. Um, it's not a complete untruth. Um, it's not a complete untruth. But here's what the New Testament teaches. Well, going back to Genesis, um, here's what the Bible teaches. God created the world to be good. In fact, Genesis uses the image of um, temple building, Near Eastern temple building. Uh, when, when God creates this world, it's using the image of, of um, these you know, pagan gods that used to, to, to build their temples. And so uh, Genesis is, in effect, saying that God built this world to be his temple. And he built, created all of these things because he intended to live here. He intended to dwell with us. And then the final thing that went in the temple was his image... Uh, which in the case of us is our humans. Humans are the image bearers of God. And we were the final ones placed in the creation. And then God came and rested and dwelt in uh, his creation and enjoyed it and delighted in it. Um, with the breaking that happened in Genesis 3, God, the presence of God and was, uh, was, was separated from the humans and from all the created order. Now, if you've got questions about that, the last two sermons really hit strong on those two points, on Genesis 3 and the fallout from Genesis 3, and why the last two sermons hit those really, really hard, so I'm not going to go into detail on that. But what happened over the course of the entire Bible is that Genesis sets up the God's presence ha having to withdraw from his created um, uh, order that was meant to be his dwelling place. The whole saga of the Bible um, has God undoing the curses of Genesis 3, fixing the core issues that were introduced in Genesis 3 um, through the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ, and then initiating this um, this revolution, right? This, this new creation, what, which will ultimately culminate in God coming back and claiming what is his. And so in Revelation, we see this vision of the new heavens and the new earth. And the holy city, the new Jerusalem, comes down from heaven and establishes itself upon the earth. And so we have this image, we start in a garden, and at the very end of the Bible, we have this kind of garden city, where it's a city, but it incorporates all of these elements of the original garden. There are the trees of life in the, are growing on either side of the river, and the, the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. And so we have this, this, this kind of symbiot symbiosis between uh, humankind and creation in this final image of, um, of, of where this is going, and the presence of God is in the middle of the city. There is no uh, temple. You don't need a temple because the presence of God is there. Uh, there is no um, need of light nor sun because the presence of God is there. And so the final kind of, the arc of this story is that God created the world to be good and to be his dwelling place. All of that got messed up. Saga, 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 saga. God comes back, claims what is his, and dwells upon his restored, renewed, resurrected new creation. Which means God is not interested in escaping the evils of this, in us escaping the evils of this world. God is interested in writing all that is wrong with this world so that he can renew it, restore it, and once again inhabit it. Now, I should, all of that, in the language of the New Testament, is going to happen um, through the Spirit of God. Uh, humans tend to like to make things better on our own, and because we are broken human beings, we tend to go awry. Um, just look at the history of utopian societies and how often they turned into horrific cults, just because humans are really messed up, and we do things like that. But that doesn't mean that the impulse is entirely bad, because the impulse of God renewing, of claiming, of not giving up on this world is entirely, completely biblical. Um, this language of when Jesus came, he preached about the new creation, he preached about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is here. Um, he didn't preach 
you're being so persecuted by the Romans, if you just believe in me, you can escape and go to heaven. Jesus never preached that sermon. Jesus preached, um, I have come to set the oppressed free. I have come to loosen the chains. I have come to make the blind see. Um, I have come to announce to now is the time of the kingdom of God. That was Jesus' message. Um, and, and, and throughout, uh, as that message continues into the New Testament, and we see the spreading of the church and the preachings uh, and teachings of Paul, we see that that message continues in the language not only of the kingdom of God, but also of the new creation, that God is doing something new, that what we see in the resurrected Christ not someone who was just resuscitated, but someone who actually came through death out the other side, became something else, something new, something different. We saw God's future for the whole of the world and for the whole of humanity, um, that all of us um, are, will be in Christ in this new resurrected life. All of creation will be resurrected into this new creation, new heavens, new earth, and all that is wrong with the world will be made well. And somehow, Christians simplify that to ask Jesus into your heart, and you get to go to heaven when you die. Now, I think I know why it happened. I think, um, well, first of all, there is, there is a biblical precedent for um, what happens in the in-between time. Of course, time is all very... <laughs> mysterious here. Um, who actually knows how much time matters once we die? Who, like, who actually knows how much time matters to God? But there is historic, there is biblical precedent for when saints, people who are in Christ, die, being held safely in the presence of God until the day comes that God's kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, the early church talked about, um, very much, about everyone waiting for the resurrection of the dead. Um, and the resurrection of the dead was the, was the day in which all would be raised, all, um, all of us would be uh, inherit Christ's resurrection, and God would bring his, his heaven to earth, and the earth would be restored, and we would live in the, the new um, Jerusalem, the new heavens, and the new earth. Um, and so there was a, a, a there is some biblical precedent, especially if you look in Revelation, there is this image of the saints um, waiting under the altar as they cry out, how long, O Lord, before, you know, your kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. So there's some biblical precedent there. But the New Testament doesn't make a big deal about it. I think what happened for Christians is that pastorally, um, because we are creatures who exist in this time, and because we are creatures who have a hard time with big numbers, and big numbers, as, as, especially as relates to time, we wanted something to focus on in the in-between. Um, before the new creation, before the resurrection, before the heavens and the earth, what happens in the meantime? My mother died. Where is she? Um, what happens to her now? Pastorally, as those conversations happened within Christianity, there became more and more emphasis on um, the kind of the throne room of God, the presence of God, um, and where saints go now if they die before the kingdom comes fully. Now what that kind of spiraled into was this emphasis on Christianity fundamentally as th something you should worry about after you die. Um, that Christianity had, was primarily concerned with the afterlife, that Christianity was primarily concerned with where you went after you die, and that what Christianity was offering you fundamentally was kind of fire insurance. It was a get out of hell free card. And the problem, <laughs> yeah, there are lots of problems with that. The problem with that is that it's not, the further we go down that road, the more we're divorcing from what the New Testament actually preached about what the heart of Christianity is. Heart of Christianity is being a part of God's reclaiming of the world. The heart of Christianity is entering into the body of Christ, being alive with the Holy Spirit, and because of that, because we become a part of God's family that way, 
we are then used, we become secret agents for God, running a resistance operation against the forces and powers and principalities of this world that would rather not overthrow Genesis 3. And if you think about Christianity that way, Yes, there is an element of what happens after I die, but most of our faith is about what happens before I die. You know, there is this um, quote, especially, this is especially odd when this gets pushed in youth groups because youth groups are not yet thinking about um, death. Maybe they should be, but they're not. And, and there was this famous interplay that's gotten passed around a lot of sermons now where this, this kid raised his hand and he said, look, I know that you're teaching me that there's life after death, and that's great, but what I'm really wondering is, is there life before death? And that's a fair question, because that's where a lot of, especially American Christians are. They, they are thinking that Christianity is all about, we're teaching there's life after death. If you go to church and you read your Bible, you get your fire insurance so that you don't go to hell, and you go to heaven, and you all get to be together after you die. That's it. That's why you do that at the end in the story. And the bulk of the New Testament. The bulk of the New Testament says that's too simple. That's too simple. It's kind of true, but it's kind of true in the way that you scratch, barely scratch the surface and ignore the bulk of what the message is. And so I want to read to you a little bit from 2 Corinthians. Paul does a whole lot of this in his various books, and so I, um, there, there's a bunch of different places you can draw from if you're trying to learn more about a new creation, kingdom of God, what this actually looks like. But I want to talk you through 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, I'm going to start here with verse 16 where he says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. If anyone is in Christ... There is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. Now, I want you to listen to that language. If anyone is in Christ, look, that's where the new creation is. If anyone is in Christ, you see a glimpse of what this new creation is going to look like. It's just a glimpse. It's not in fullness yet. It's the first fruits of the Spirit. You see this glimpse, if anyone was in Christ, look, new creation. If anyone was in Christ, then they are entrusted with this ministry of reconciliation, drawing the world back to its original plan for God. And obviously this is not a human effort. If it is a human effort, it is doomed. In, and if, uh, if we go by history, we'll become one of the many horrific examples of history of humans doing terrible things. But if it is filled with the Holy Spirit, if it is God-driven, if it is actually inspired, then... We don't know exactly how, to, how God's going to do it, but we do know God has not given up on that which he loves, and God will come to claim that which he loves, which is the created order. And so the work of reconciliation is those who are in Christ going out and reconciling the world back to God. In the, in, in, go back to last week's sermon, those three things that were broken in Eden, the relationship between human and human, the relationship between human and creation, the relationship between human and God. Whenever we see the healing of those three relationships, we glimpse the kingdom of God. Whenever we see the healing, even in a small, a small way, of those three primordial relationships, we glimpse the kingdom of God, and we anticipate the day in which those broken relationships will be healed fully, in the kingdom of God, in the new Jerusalem, in the new creation, in the new heaven, in the new earth, whichever language you want to use. Being a Christian is about being a part of that great rescue mission to make that happen. And if we die before it is complete, and because God is on God's time and not ours, we likely will die before it is complete, we will be safe and secure in the presence of our Heavenly Father, awaiting the day 
that it is complete. Now, how do you talk about that, right? So what I've just laid out for you is the fact that Christian faith as we understand it is about becoming a, someone new, right? It's about becoming a part of a, a, a community, a spirit-filled community. It's about, becoming, it's, it's about having a vocation of bringing God's kingdom to earth. It is about a whole life, whole-bodied experience that will take everything we have throughout our entire lives. How then do you answer the question, how do I get into heaven? So here's what I would say. I would say, first of all, it's the wrong question for all of the reasons I just said. But second of all, you're kind of asking the what, in a roundabout way, it becomes the right question. If you phrase it this way, how do I become a part of what God is trying to do, right? How do I become a part of God's family? How do I become a part of God's story? How do I become a part of this faith that you are proclaiming? How do I say yes to that? And if, however you want to phrase it, the thing is when people ask questions like this, they are getting to that. And so you want to start with the caveat that that's the wrong question, but then getting to how do I get in, that's a very valid question. That's a very valid question and different iterations of Christianity have different opinions on it. Um, everyone agrees that the work was already done for you. This is last week's sermon, Why Did Jesus Have to Die? The work was already done for you. You have already been deemed justified by the Christ's blood. You have already been uh, invited into the Christ's life. You have already been chosen. <laughs> You have already been invited, all of that. How do I accept the invitation? How do I leave my life and enter God's life? How do I leave this narcissistic, self-centered existence and become a part of the resistance movement for God? All right, now I'm going to take you to a different passage. I'm going to take you back to Acts. In Acts... Um, we have the story of the birth of the church, and here's what happened. The, after the resurrection and the ascension, uh, the disciples were waiting together in an upper room, and as they were waiting and praying, God showed up in a new and a powerful way, and there was the sound of wind, and there was something that looked like tongues of fire, and the scripture tells us the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples. And they were so filled with the Spirit that they poured out into the streets and they were preaching and praying and proclaiming. And anyone who listened heard them in their own language. And while all of this was going on, Peter stood up and he gave the first sermon. And the first sermon... He talked about how all of this was the, the, the fruition, the outpouring of the story of Israel and the story of what God had done in Israel and then what God had done in Jesus and what God was doing in Jesus. And he pointed to the prophets and he said, all of these, this is being fulfilled now. God is doing something new. God is, God is answering our prayers. God is showing up. God is fulfilling his promises. And at the very end of his sermon, people came up to him. And this is, so I'm in Acts chapter 2. And they said, brothers, what should we do? Which is a version of the question, how do I get into heaven? What should we do? What do I do? I've heard this, I want in, what do I do? And this is what Peter said. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the Holy, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm going to unpack that a little bit because some of you who grew up um, with very angry preachers using the word repent are having PTSD right now. So let's unpack this. 
repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. What does the word repent mean? The word repent means to turn. And fundamentally, um, what, what Paul is, the Peter is laying out there are two kind of halves to the story of becoming, entering God's story, becoming a part of God's people. The baptism part is, uh, I, there's actually a sermon we preached on baptism just a few weeks ago. If you go back on the website, that's there. Um, the baptism is the public commitment. It's the public receiving of the gift that was offered. Um, I want you to think about what the difference between uh, a marriage and a wedding. The marriage is the sus- substance of the relationship, but the, mar- the wedding is the public ceremony that makes public to all the world that this relationship is being initiated. And it does it in public eye, and it does it it, 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 it's to be celebrated by the entire community. That is much what we see of Peter um, saying with this, this, this language of baptism is some sort of, is baptism was a public way of entering into a covenant, almost the same way you enter into the covenant of, of, of marriage, right? B- baptism was a public way of marrying the church, of receiving the gift that had been given to you through the death and resurrection of Christ, and through that receiving of that gift, um, then um, entering into a lifelong covenant with, with Christ and with his church. And so there's this, 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 this public commitment half of it, and, and it's preceded by this phrase, repent, or this word repent, turn. And what I'm going to suggest to you this morning is that those two halves of it talk about fundamentally the internal and the external of what it means to engage in the Christian faith. Because repenting, turning, there are all kinds of ways that we can do that, but I don't think Peter primarily here was talking about outwardly changing direction, right? Walking down the road and making a U-turn. I think he was talking about the inclination of our heart. And the word repent to turn suggests to me that the beginnings of our faith are when we turn back to the God who turned toward all of us in the sacrifice of Christ. Now, what does that mean? Do you remember back in Genesis chapter 3? We've talked a lot about Genesis 3. That's where, that's because it's a very important chapter. Do you remember back in Genesis chapter 3, the words of the serpent that kind of misquoted God, but then also kind of asked this question that wasn't entirely wrong, but fundamentally the, the undercurrent of the question was, can God really be trusted can you really, can you really trust God? And it was the first question th- that exemplified what it meant to approach God with a hermeneutic of suspicion. Hermeneutic is a big word that just means worldview, like the way you read the world. To approach God with suspicion, to acro- approach God with questioning, to approach God as though we are the ones judging God, to approach God from the standpoint of you have to earn my approval, you have to earn my worship, you have to prove to me why you are, why you are worthy to be worshipped. All of that is the fruit of a broken humanity that are the heirs of Genesis 3. And the word repent, I think, implies the turning of our hearts away from the suspicion of God and back toward the trust of God. So, so when I got married, I knew, you know, everyone tells you there's, there are going to be up days, good days and bad days, up times and bad times, all that, all that's true. Um, but what I didn't realize is how much the inner workings of my heart would have an effect on <laughs> whether it was a good time or a bad time. 
there was one time I came home and he wasn't home. And there was something that had happened that just made me internally fly off the handle, right? And I was suddenly, I was angry and I was mentally hashing out this argument inside of myself and my heart was, was ready for battle, right? I just, I, <laughs> I was girding my loins and putting on my armor and it was all just ready for battle inside of me. Um, Jordan wasn't home at the time. He didn't get home until hours later. And when he did get home, um, my heart was in a completely different place. My heart was in a completely different place. And the thing is, what occurred to me as we were talking about it later, is that the externals of the situation, so I have no idea, I don't even remember what, he, what, what had happened. Like, let's just say the kitchen was not cleaned or something stupid like that. The externals of the situation had not changed. He had still done whatever he, he'd done or not done whatever he'd done. The externals of the situation not, had not changed. What had changed was the direction of my heart was a heart that was either directed in mistrust, in anger, in suspicion, or a heart that was directed in trust and in love. And I'm gonna suggest to you this morning that when Christians talk about faith, most of what they're talking about is trust. Because allowing the gift of God to move freely within you and allowing the spirit of God to move freely within you. I think matters far less about whether you say the right words in a prayer and far more on whether your heart is open and trusting of the God who gave his all for you. And the truth of the matter is because you're human and because we're human, we go back and forth a lot which is why repentance is not a one-time thing. In fact, if you listen to the church year, we will call you to repent over and over and over and over again, and it's because we know you. We have seen you on social media. We know you need it. We know how easy it is for your heart to be seduced away, especially by this world, to be seduced away into suspicion and distrust of the God who gave himself for you. And we know that it's going to be a lifelong correction to bring our heart back again and again and again away from the Genesis 3 that says, can God be trusted? And instead entering into the story of Jesus that says, my father, not my will, but thine be done. If you want it, I trust you. And that kind of trust and that kind of faith opens us to allow God to actually work inside. And so what I suggest to you that Paul is talking about here is these two halves, these two halves of entering the Christian story are the inner dimension and the outer dimension. An inner dimension of a constant turning toward God, an outer dimension of making a public celebration of that turning toward God. And then just engaging in the story. You know, it's like, it's like a marriage. If your marriage was your wedding day, it all be over in a day, but it's not. Your marriage is everything that happens every morning, every evening, every waking up and fulfilling all of those marriage vows to, to love, honor, and cherish day in and day out. And it's the most wonderful thing in the world and the most terrible thing in the world and the most wonderful thing in the world. And the wedding was important, but the wedding was, was just a symbol, it was just the very beginning was if you had the wedding without the marriage, you, it would mean nothing, right? Because the entire meat, the entire purpose of the wedding is to kick off the marriage. And that is what is offered to you. Not a life lived on your own with a get out of hell card tucked into your back pocket, but a life lived for God. 
a life lived as part of the people who are bringing the kingdom of God to earth, a life lived as part of the community that is incarnating the new creation on earth, a life lived in a constant turning back and back and back and back and back and choosing trust again and again and again and relying on the grace of God to do the rest. Friends, I'm going to suggest to you that I realize it's a harder answer, but it's a better one. Um, the answer about pray the magic prayer and you get into heaven, um, I know people who did that and it wasn't me. They prayed the magic prayer and then they never thought about it again. And did it do something? Maybe. But it's not what Peter was talking about. It's not what Paul was talking about. It's not what Jesus was talking about. Because the invitation is a wholehearted, whole life, whole bodied invitation to give all of us to the story that God is telling in this earth. And, and when you do that, it is so much better than just getting fire insurance. It's so much better. So much deeper, so much wholer, so much better. Um, there was a woman that I. One of my previous churches I was pastoring in, there was a woman that had, um, while I was pastor, started to take her faith seriously for the first time. She'd been to church before, she'd gone to church before, but she'd never, she'd never really started digging into it. And while I was there, she really did. She got into Bible studies, she really got into the sermons, she got into Sunday school. And she got into this one ministry that we did. Um, and the ministry was very simple. It was, we went out to some of the apartment complexes that were very near the church, but um, none of the people came to the church. It was, um, uh, proj it was you know, government-assisted housing. Um, it was primarily kids who, who needed help in school. And, um, and they were just a few blocks from the church. And so one of the ministries that we started was simply going out every now and then and hosting a play day on the lawn for the kids. And that's it. We, just, we, we came out. We had snacks. We had chalk. We had coloring pages. We had footballs. And we just hung out and we talked. We got to know the parents, we got to know the kids, we loved them on, on them a little bit, and that was it. Um, and we did that for month and month and month and month, and, um, and she started going. And it was something she'd never done before in her life. Um, you know, from a theological perspective, we could say all this stuff about what, you know, what we were trying to do in this break of relationship between human and human and um, poverty and, and family. We could say all kinds of things, but at from the level of someone actually showing, showing up, we were just showing up to love, right? We were just loving people. We were just trying to act like Jesus in the presence of people with no agenda. And she'd never done that before, especially with um, people that she didn't normally socially interact with. And so she did it, and she, she went a, a couple times, and then she got excited and went a couple more times. And then after one particular time when she had just, you know, really bonded and had had this experience with, um, with you know, mentoring one of these kids. And she came back to me and she said, Meredith, that's what you've been talking about on Sunday morning, isn't it? That's what the kingdom of God looks like. And I said, yeah. And then she said, looked at me and she said, that's awesome. And I said, yeah, it is. It is. Friends, the real answer to the real question is awesome. And it is so much bigger and so much deeper and so much more than how do I get into heaven. And if how do I get into heaven is where you start, fine, but don't stop there. Because what is waiting for you beyond that question is the kingdom of God. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty Heavenly Father, you have given us so much. You've poured yourself out for us, and you have entrusted us with a ministry of reconciliation. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, kindle in us the fire of your love, that we may receive you and be you for the world. This we pray as we pray together the prayer our Lord taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, on this first Sunday of the month, we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. This is when we celebrate that God draws us closer to each other, um, that God draws us mysteriously and mystically into the body of Christ, and that God offers to us what we need, and God renews and restores us for the journey of head. And so if you have your elements from the church, I invite you to go get them. If you have bread or wine from out around your house, you may also use that. Would you join with me as we pray upon these sacraments? The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your heart, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a new and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image. You breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity. You made covenant to be our sovereign God, and you spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release of the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, he fed the hungry, and he ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and in thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, through your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Now as you take and you eat, I invite you to feast on him in your hearts through faith. And then in prayer, offer back and give thanks to the one who has fed you with his own hand.
center of judge and not defender. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated I say
that Jesus Christ is alone. Hey. And say, I believe in you. And I And I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Can we sing it one more time, everybody, from the front to the back? Lift your voice and say, I believe in you. And I believe you rose again. And I Life eternal. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin. I believe in the saints' communion and in your. I believe in the resurrection. Oh, I believe in the name of Jesus. And now, my brothers and sisters, go in peace and joy and love and life and faith and in hope. No, go knowing that you go in the presence and the blessing of God now and all the days of your life. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.